The Fellowship of the Ring J. R. R. Tolkien. Prologue. 1. Concerning Hobbits. This book is largely concerned with hobbits, and from its pages a reader may discover much of their character and a little of their history. Further information will also be found in the selection from the Red Book of Westmarch that has already been published, under the title of The Hobbit. That story was derived from the earlier chapters of the Red Book, composed by Bilbo himself, the first hobbit to become famous in the world at large, and called by him there and back again, since they told of his journey into the East and his return, an adventure which later involved all the hobbits in the great events of that age that are here related. Many, however, may wish to know more about this remarkable people from the outset, while some may not possess the earlier book. For such readers a few notes on the more important points are here collected from Hobbit lore, and the first adventure is briefly recalled. Hobbits are an unobtrusive but very ancient people, more numerous formerly than they are today, for they love peace and quiet and good tilled earth, a well-ordered and well-farmed countryside was their favorite haunt. They do not and did not understand or like machines more complicated than a forge bellows, a watermill, or a hand loom, though they were skillful with tools. Even in ancient days they were, as a rule, shy of the big folk, as they call us, and now they avoid us with dismay and are becoming hard to find. They are quick of hearing and sharp-eyed, and though they are inclined to be fat and do not hurry unnecessarily, they are nonetheless nimble and deft in their movements. They possessed from the first the art of disappearing swiftly and silently, when large folk whom they do not wish to meet come blundering by and this and they have developed until to men it may seem magical. But hobbits have never, in fact, studied magic of any kind, and their elusiveness is due solely to a professional skill that heredity and practice, and a close friendship with the earth, have rendered inimitable by bigger and clumsier braces. For they are a little people, smaller than dwarves, less stout and stocky, that is, even when they are not actually much shorter. Their height is variable ranging between two and four feet of our measure. They seldom now reach three feet, but they hived windled, they say, and in ancient days they were taller. According to the Red Book, Bandobras took, Bullroarer, son of Isengrim II, was four foot five and able to ride a horse. He was surpassed in all Hobbit records only by two famous characters of old, but that curious matter is dealt with in this book. As for the Hobbits of the Shire, with whom these tales are concerned, in the days of their peace and prosperity they were a merry folk. They dressed in bright colors, being notably fond of yellow and green, but they seldom wore shoes, since their feet had tough leathery soles and were clad in a thick curling hair, much like the hair of their heads, which was commonly brown. Thus, the only craft little practiced among them was shoemaking, but they had long and skillful fingers and could make many other useful and comely things. Their faces were as a rule good-natured rather than beautiful, broad, bright-eyed, red-cheeked, with mouths apt to laughter, into eating and drinking. And laugh they did, and eat, and drink, often and heartily, being fond of simple jests at all times, and of six meals a day, when they could get them. They were hospitable and delighted in parties, and in presents which they gave away freely and eagerly accepted. It is plain indeed that in spite of later estrangement hobbits are relatives of ours, far nearer to us than else, or even than dwarves. Of old they spoke the languages of men, after their own fashion, and liked and disliked much the same things as men did. But what exactly our relationship is can no longer be discovered. The beginning of hobbits lies far back in the elder days that are now lost and forgotten. Only the elves still preserve any records of that vanished time, and their traditions are concerned almost entirely with their own history, in which men appear seldom and hobbits are not mentioned at all. Yet it is clear that hobbits had, in fact, lived quietly in Middle-earth for many long years before other folk became even aware of them. And the world being after all full of strange creatures beyond count, these little people seemed of very little importance. But in the days of Bilbo, and of Frodo his heir, they suddenly became, by no wish of their own, both important and renowned, and troubled the counsels of the wise and the great. Those days, the third age of Middle-earth, are now long past, and the shape of all lands has been changed, but the regions in which hobbits then lived were doubtless the same as those in which they still linger, the northwest of the old world, east of the sea. 
Of their original home the hobbits in Bilbo's time preserved no knowledge. A love of learning, other than genealogical lore, was far from general among them, but there remained still a few in the older families who studied their own books, and even gathered reports of old times and distant lands from elves, dwarves, and men. Their own records began only after the settlement of the Shire and their most ancient legends hardly looked further back than their wandering days. It is clear, nonetheless, from these legends, and from the evidence of their peculiar words and customs, that like many other folk hobbits had in a distant past moved westward. Their earliest tales seem to glimpse a time when they dwelt in the upper vales of Anduin, between the eaves of Greenwood the Great and the Misty Mountains. Why they later undertook the hard and perilous crossing of the mountains into Eriador is no longer certain. Their own accounts speak of the multiplying of men in the land, and of a shadow that fell on the 